Hello, everybody. We are live and just about ready to answer your questions. We're here to talk about the recent storms that are basically everywhere right now. And we're going to be talking about what we can do to try and deal with the storms as they're happening, how to prepare for them and how to deal with them. And as importantly, when you have a claim potentially, what to do about it. So I'm going to make a quick note in here so that people will know, people meaning you, that it is A-OK to go ahead and put your questions in the chat and I will be happy to answer them. Meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead also and I'm going to invite some other folk so that uh, we know everyone can know that we are live and we are here to answer your questions. And uh, we are live now. And there we go. So uh, as you probably <clears throat> as you probably know, if you are <laughs> anywhere in uh, California for sure, then uh, you you would know that uh, you you are <laughs> we are having some difficult times when it comes to the weather, and we are having some difficult times when it comes to dealing with storms like we have never seen before. Truly, we are dealing with storms that we have never seen before. And I want to be here to try and be a resource for you to help you through, give you some ideas of what you can do as we're, at least depending on where you are, you might be in the beginning of the storm, in the middle of the storm or the tail end of the storm, but one way or another, you probably are dealing with something storm related. And I wanna be here to try and help you with that. Some of the things that I wanted to mention right up front are, if you are in the middle of a storm right now, for example, if you're in California and you are in midst of storm world, it's funny, while I'm saying that, I'm getting a call from the Department of Water and Power probably telling me that, hey, Looks like your power might be coming back on soon, which would be nice. Uh, I'm running off of a backup battery, and this is actually going out over my uh, my backup satellite internet connection. So what you are looking at is a product of Tesla. I have the Tesla power battery, and I have the Tesla Starlink, or I guess shouldn't say Tesla, the Starlink product all together that is keeping me online. So you are watching everything on my backup system, including the not so exciting background. So you'll probably see the rain. So like I was saying, one of the things that I want you to be aware of is if you have had a claim or you're in a situation right now where you're in the, in the middle of the storm and you wanna do something about it, there are some things you can still do. It's not too late. And I'll go over a few of those. The first thing you wanna keep in mind in the event that you are in the middle of a storm right now is, Go and check your sprinklers, because what I find is that when there are storms going on, people still tend to forget that they need to turn the sprinklers off, right? The sprinklers are on automatic, and the sprinklers will be running while there's storms outside. And let's face it, we won't, we won't notice because we're in the house, and the sprinklers are on in the front, or they're on in the back. We don't see it. People drive by. They see the sprinklers. No one's going to pull over and stop and knock on your door and say, hey, neighbor, you've got your sprinklers running. Turn them off. There's a major storm going on. So even if you're in the middle of a storm now, go check the sprinklers and be sure that they are shut off because that is a, definitely a big one that you will find that people will leave their sprinklers running in the middle of a storm, which is kind of nutty, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is you obviously want to try and have your car parked somewhere as safe as possible, right? In a garage, ideally, or a carport, somewhere covered. If you're in a situation where you have to park on the street, we're going to have to go back in your mind, way back to the days of driver's ed. Now, if you'll remember in driver's ed, they taught you, depending on the street, if you're on an uphill and you're parking, you turn the wheel to the left. And that way, if the car brake goes out, it falls back into the curb. And if you're on a street going down, you turn the wheel to the right and the same thing will happen. Now, when you're dealing with storms like we're seeing, at least in California right now, when there's six, seven, eight inches of water, that is more than enough for your vehicle to hydroplane. Hydroplane, just a fancy word for your car to be raised off the water, uh, off the ground. It's kind of amazing when you think about it, that that small amount of water can lift up that many thousands of potentially of pounds, but it happens all the time. So 
go out there if you've got your car on the street and make that little adjustment and make sure that the car is going to be parked and aiming toward the sidewalk in the event that there is enough water you don't want the car to go sailing down the street and and most importantly if you see that happening don't try and stop it you're not going to be able to stop it it's 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 too late you can't get in front of the car to stop it please chasing after it not going to do much unless you want to chase behind it yelling get out of the way to everybody even if you're able to catch the car and get inside the car you can't press the brake and make the car stop there's really nothing that you're going to be able to do once that car is in the water high enough and is being dragged along. So keep in mind, you want to try and do things to prevent that from happening. But if you've already missed that window and the car is off and going, just let it go. Another one to keep in mind is when you have storms that are going on like this, we tend to be a little bit kind of addicted to our, our phones, right? And if there's a power outage, the first thing we think is, well, the power goes out, the internet goes out, I'm, I'm SOL. Well, the truth is, the majority of time, your internet connection is running through a modem of some kind, and that's going through one infrastructure. And if there's no power, yes, your modem will turn off and you will lose internet connectivity. However, if you have a cell phone, the cell phone connection goes through a completely different infrastructure that goes through cell towers. So it's entirely possible that you may have your internet out at home. However, your cell phone internet connection will work just fine. So be sure that you have your cell phone batteries charged. If you've got a few extra battery packs, practice what I preach, keep those handy. Be sure that you're in a position that you can keep that phone running. That phone is your lifeline. If emergency services needs to reach, to reach out to you or you need to reach out to them, you can do that. And keep in mind also, you're also you can probably also use your phone to connect your computer to the internet. You can tether that depending on how tech savvy you may or may not be. It's, not terribly difficult. So if you do want to continue when you want to work on your laptop and that's charged, go ahead and do that. You can tether it to your phone. The most important thing is be sure that you have that phone charged. And if you have some extra batteries around, have them handy because that is your connection to the outside world when all of these things are happening. Okay. So keep that in mind. You want to be sure that you have your cell phone charged and handy. That is your lifeline during these storms. Now, we're talking about the power going out, and that, of course, happened in during the storms out in the West Coast. And we were talking about power outages that were happening in different parts of the uh, parts of town all up and down uh, California. Uh, over half a million people at some point were, was, were in areas that did not have power. So what do you do? Well, there are some things you can do, even if you don't have tons, you don't have a fancy battery backup system or anything along those lines. The first thing is, don't go browsing in your refrigerator, right? Open it up, take something out, close it. Let the cold air stay in, all right? I know, I know, we're, we're sort of used to that. We open the fridge and we stare and we go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. think about it, maybe it could be. No, you don't want to do that. You want to keep the cold air in as much as possible. Think about what you want, go get it, close the fridge back up. The next thing you can do is if you open the freezer, you'll find that there are items in the freezer that, you might be able to do without, or let's just say they could survive being frozen again. Maybe the frozen peas or the vegetables. Maybe you have ice packs, things like that. Take those items out of the freezer and put them in the refrigerator. They're going to help cool off the refrigerator and keep it cool. So the food that's inside, which is more than likely the food that you're going to be keeping and the food you're going to be eating in the event that the power stays out too, you know, long enough, will keep that cold. It's more important to keep your food that you're going to be able to eat um, fresh than it is to keep your ice cream from melting. I know, painful to say, but it's but it's true. Food is more important than ice cream. It's just the way it is, all right? So that's something else that you can keep in mind. I'm gonna take a quick stop here and see if I have any questions in uh, in chat. And it does not look like I have any questions as of yet. If you have any questions about what your insurance policy may or may not cover or how to deal with a claim, feel free to put it in the chat and I will answer it for you right away. That's why I'm here today. I'm Carl Sussman, host of Insurance Hour, which is a radio program that's syndicated across five stations. We're also here on YouTube and you can also, of course, get it on your favorite podcast aggregator. And today we're talking about the storms. We're talking about claims. We're talking about insurance. We're talking about the repercussions of the storm 
and potentially filing a claim and 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 all those other things that come along with with storm damage. Something else that seems to be coming up with some frequency uh, is people are concerned about putting in claims right now. And I completely get that because in a lot of the markets, it's difficult to obtain property insurance. And so you've been told, don't put a claim in unless it's really important because you don't want to have that that scarlet letter. You don't want to have that strike on your record. You don't want to have that mark that, well, you had a claim. And I understand that. When it comes to events like this, there's something called a cat loss, C-A-T. And no, it's not if you lose your kitten. It's a cat loss. It's short in the industry for catastrophe loss. And what most insurance companies do when there are catastrophes, such as we saw again, we're talking about California right now, you're going to have you be in a position where if the insurance company considers it a cat loss, then likely they're not going to charge that claim against you. They're not going to hold it against you because it's not something that you could have prepared for or prevented in some way. Now, every insurance company has their own guidelines for deciding what's a cat loss and what's not a cat loss. However, I think it's pretty safe to say, for the most part, if there's a natural disaster and there's a state of emergency declared, most of the insurance companies will automatically say, okay, well, I guess it's a cat loss then. Don't hold me to it because, again, every insurance carrier has their own like, their own guidelines, their own ability to decide whether they're going to consider something a cat loss or not. But you can pretty much keep in mind, if it's something major, you are going to be in a better position to file that claim than you would be if, I don't know, your toilet overflowed and there's a couple of bucks damage to the tiles by the toilet, right? That type of claim is entirely different then, oh my God, there was this major storm and then the roof was leaking and it was all over the place. Different, completely different. So the mantra all of a sudden has changed from don't put the claim into when you're talking about cat catastrophic losses like we've been seeing now, it's a little more acceptable to put those claims in, all right? And again, the general rule of thumb hasn't changed. If it's a small claim, if it's something that you can write a check for out of your checking account, it's not going to hurt you and you're in an area where getting property insurance is difficult, that still might be the best thing to do. However, understand that these types of events do make it easier for you to look to put a claim in than, again, the average vanilla claim that might happen. Like I said, you toilet overflows, there's a leak in the sink, something along those lines happens. Different ball game, which makes sense, right? Let me just check to see if we have any other questions about the storms and or claims and or and or nothing in there right now so i'll just i will just keep yapping away so again we're here talking about the recent storms and how they're affecting you your insurance policy and what you should be doing going forward i was speaking with some folks in florida and they were talking about some insane hail storms that were happening and they were talking about hail the size of golf balls or softballs which i can't even imagine and not because I'm not athletic and don't play golf or softball, even though that is true. I can tell you that I, I can't even imagine that happening. And they're having major storms of hail. Now, you can imagine what this hail does to vehicles. It just pummels the vehicles and it causes tons and tons of damage to the vehicle. Now, again, the rule of thumb is, again, try and keep the vehicle somewhere where it's covered if you can. If you can't, don't try and protect it by yourself. And I've heard stories. People will try and go out there and, you know, put some something over the car. And meanwhile, hail's pounding down. You are more important than the vehicle. OK, so you can get hurt. Think about it. Getting smacked by a frozen golf ball falling from the sky. That's going to that's going to leave a mark. That's going to hurt. So your safety is first. And then what comes next? We worry about that next. The insurance policy on the vehicle is something that you'll deal with next. Okay, there's your, your PSA on avoid the hail. But speaking of vehicles, and we were talking a moment ago about rain and some of the storms that are hitting the West Coast, you might not have flood insurance. You might not even have homeowners or renters insurance. However, if you have comprehensive coverage, or sometimes it's referred to as other than collision coverage, basically it's physical damage on your vehicle if your vehicle is not in motion. If your vehicle gets damaged by water, then that particular coverage under your auto insurance policy can actually be triggered and you may actually be able to put a claim in on that. Rules apply as well, right? You're going to be looking to see what the damage is caused by and you're going to put the claims in. What I'm telling a lot of people right now is cast a wide net. 
If you have significant damage, put the claims in, let the insurance companies do what they do. That's really, this is why you have an insurance policy. It's really not for the little things. It's for the big things. So if something major like this happens, don't be shy about putting in that claim. And if you're not sure how to do it, talk to your agent or broker, get some advice. They're the experts. That's what they get paid the big bucks for and find out, does it make sense to put this claim in? I think it's going to cost X dollars. Should I not put this claim in? What should I do? So keep those things in mind that just because the damage is water related, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be covered under a property policy. It could be covered under an auto policy. We're, we're looking more at what the actual item is that's damaged versus which policy you're going to put the claim in on. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, of course, this goes against what we normally think, because if somebody broke into your car and stole something, then the likelihood is you're not going to have coverage under your vehicle policy. You would probably have coverage under a property policy for your property away from home. Again, we're talking about damage to the vehicle, not necessarily damage to personal property that's inside the vehicle. Does that make sense? Take another quick break and see if there's any questions here. I don't see any questions popping up just yet. So I will keep rattling. We're about halfway through what I'm planning to be a 30-minute show right now, just to go over again some of the things that you can be looking out for in the event that you are affected by some of this weather activity that is affecting all parts of the country. I know that in California, there's been dramatic power outages. There's been trees falling. Hey, let's talk about trees. What happens if a tree falls? What's that old saying? If a tree falls in the woods and nobody hears it, does it still make a sound? I think I heard another version of that. It was probably something I shouldn't repeat. If you know the joke, you know what I'm talking about. Let's talk about a tree. All right. If there is a tree that falls down because of the storm, this is something that would typically be covered under your homeowner's insurance policy. Now you're going to get into the, well, is it my tree? Is it my neighbor's tree? If my neighbor's tree falls on my house or my tree falls on my neighbor's house, there are lots of permutations of this. And again, this is not something that you need to get in, that you need to start going through in your own head. If there's damage like that from a tree, put a claim in with your insurance company. If it turns out that the tree is on the other, uh, on your neighbor's property and it's their responsibility, believe me, your insurance company will be the first ones to tell you, hey, it's their fault. And they will either assist you with a claim against their policy, or if there's a problem, they will potentially pay the claim and then they will do what's called subrogate. They'll go to the neighbor's insurance policy to get reimbursed for what they paid you. Make sense? It's pretty cool, actually. Subrogation is a big deal because a lot of times you just want to get the work done. You just want to have your claim settled. You want to get back to the way things were and move on with the world. And you don't want to deal with your neighbor's insurance policy. And let's face it, not all neighbors are wonderful people. And sometimes if something that is their responsibility caused damage to you, I doubt they're going to be extra friendly at that point, let alone you're saying, give me your insurance information, give me your insurance information. Hmm, not sure how that might go either. So keep in mind, even if it's not necessarily your fault, and again, I don't want you to try and make that determination. You don't want to go out there with a tape measure and try and find the property line or look and see. Or And there's other things to be considered as well. There's who's been maintaining the tree. There's negligence. There's all sorts of stuff that are that is that are more legal than insurance, and I will not even think about going close to that. However, just keep in mind, if you have downed trees from a storm, go to your property insurance policy and file the claim and let the experts deal with it, okay? As far as filing claims go also, I want you to keep something that's pretty important in mind. Now, there are lots of different ways to file claims. You can make a phone call, you can go online, you might even be able to put a claim in on an, on an app, right? There's one thing they, uh, that they all have in common that are really, really important. After you file that claim, you need to get the claim number, or as one of my clients referred to it as the receipt, which is, which is a good way of putting it, right? We all know what a receipt is. It's proof that you bought something. You want to get that claim number for a few reasons. Number one, Sometimes, especially if you're filing the claim online, you might be filing the claim and then you might not push that last button, right? Something just happens in the process. Maybe you you actually do complete the claim, you have your claim number, but something happens on the insurance company's end and the claim simply doesn't get processed. 
Well, you need to have that claim number because that is your proof, right? That is your proof of purchase. Like we used to have on cereal boxes, the proof of purchase. And that is what you will need in the event that you don't get a call from the adjuster. You don't get some type of activity from the claim that you filed. You'll have that to be able to say, okay, here is my, my proof. This is when I filed the claim. Here's the claim number. It came from you. And the insurance carrier will then be able to look at that and, and realize, oh, okay, and, and go from there. So if you're speaking to someone and filing the claim, ask for a claim number. Sometimes when you make a phone call, there's two steps you might have to go through. And nobody likes this. It's just the reality. There's usually an initial person that will answer the phone once you press all the right buttons. And they're going to be what's called the claim taker. The claim taker is going to just take the basic information. What happened? And you would say, for example, the tree fell down. And they might even go as far as asking you, is it your tree? They might not. They might just say, okay, tree fell down. Get, they'll, they'll have your policy number. Or if you don't have it, you can give them your information and hopefully they can look that up for you. They'll mark down tree fell down. They'll give you a claim number. Sometimes they'll give you a claims adjuster's name and phone number. They'll assign it on the spot right away. Sometimes they won't. Depends on the insurance company. If they don't assign an insurance adjuster on the spot, again, even more important, be sure that you have that claim number. If they do assign you an insurance claims adjuster, keep in mind, I know you want to immediately hang up with claims and call the claims adjuster. I know I would. You want to get things fixed. When we're talking about major losses that are going on right now, keep in mind that these claims adjusters are going to be busy not minimizing the fact that everyone should be handled as quick as possible. And they are. Believe me, an insurance company does not like to have an open claim or a claim that's just floating around, not done. They have to take out what are called reserves. I'll spare you all the inside baseball you know, about what that means. Suffice it to say that insurance carriers do not like unsettled claims. They don't like open claims. It's a problem for them financially. And statistically, it leads to larger payouts. So they do not want this. They want to get to you as quickly as possible and get the claim handled. So again, going back, you might talk initially to one person who is the claim taker, right? And they're going to take just basic information. And then they'll say, just a moment, they'll transfer you to another department. It's kind of like when you go to the doctor's office and you have to go through and explain your symptoms to 10 people before the doctor comes in, a little bit like that. But this is usually only two people. And that next person might come in and ask a little bit more detail about what happened. Is it your tree? Where did it fall? Is there anybody hurt? They might get a little bit more information like that, okay? Just as important as I'm saying to get the claim number, if you are able to get the claims adjuster's information, here's what I would do. And I know claims adjusters out there are watching this and they're, go they're going to send me hate mail and the comments are going to get vicious. I would send a very nice email to them or avoid, leave them a message, just you know, call quickly and say, hey, this is so-and-so, um, this is my claim number, I just opened it up, I'm sure you're super busy, just wanted to let you know, here's my cell phone if you want to reach me, here's my email address, just so you have everything handy, looking forward to talking to you, thanks again, done. Because you've made that connection, and and you know, claims adjusters have it rough, I have to tell you. Uh, I have a, My sister was a claims adjuster for 20 years, and let me tell you, that, that is a thankless job. You are talking to people that are pissed, guaranteed. No one has a claim and it puts them in a good mood, right? That just doesn't happen. If there is someone that's had a loss, they've had a claim and they're talking to a claims adjuster, something bad happened. So these people that, that deal with claims, literally their job description probably says, are you okay dealing with pissed off people? Because that is literally what they do all day in the office all the time. They're dealing with angry people. So I find that maybe acknowledging that, acknowledging that to them or giving a little bit of a nice nicety to start can go a long way because if they've got 30 people to call back before the end of the day and they're checking their voicemail and they happen to get a message from someone, yeah, this person was actually nice enough to call and they weren't a jerk and they didn't, they weren't pushy. I'll give them a call. I'll probably call them first, right? Same thing with an email. Believe me again, the adjusters know they have to get through to everybody. There are certain regulations, depending on the state you're in, that dictate how quickly they must make that initial contact. 
Actually, I did a show earlier on some new legislation that went into effect in 2024 that spelled out specifically, depending on what state you're in, how long it, an insurance adjuster can take to make their initial contact and how long if they change adjusters, which is always fun, if they change adjusters, how quickly the new adjuster has to contact you, what information needs to be passed on, what summaries, what documentation you can request from the adjuster to be sure that everyone's on the same page. There is a lot that goes on behind the scenes when it comes to claims. And the best thing you can do is be completely honest, be completely transparent, and as much as you don't want to be because you want it done, try and be patient, especially in times when there are massive volume of claims coming through the door. One other thing insurance carriers will do, at least the good ones, is in the event of a large loss, like we might be seeing if there's a catastrophe going on, if there's a hurricane, if there's a major storm, they will take claims adjusters from other states and they will assign them to work in your area. Now, when I say in your area, of course, everyone's working remotely for the most part. So they will simply have more people answering the phone. So instead of having X number of adjusters that normally will work a particular area, it might be X times 10. So all of a sudden you're talking to somebody and they've got a funny accent because they're in another part of the country you're not used to. And that's because they were brought in, brought in, right? They come over, the carrier said, okay, you're a claims adjuster in a different state. We don't care. We need claims. We want to get through to our customers and they will bring them over so you can start speaking with them. And that is sometimes what will happen is you'll have that one adjuster for a while. They will handle the easy, fast claims. And then you might get assigned a second adjuster. And again, it's not because you were annoying. It's not because of anything you've done. It just means that those people that were brought in specifically to deal with that massive volume of claims that were coming in. They did their job. Things are settling down. And then the claims adjusters that are more familiar with the area, they come in and they start to do what they do. Okay. Again, don't take it personally. I know it's super frustrating. Sometimes you make a relationship with your adjuster. They, they trust you. You've been honest. They ask you for something. You've got it. Things are just moving along. And then all of a sudden you get an email from them that says, I'm no longer your adjuster. Here's your new adjuster. And you go, oh, why? That's usually why, especially if it's during a time when there have been large volumes of claims coming in. It's usually because the claims adjuster has gone back to their territory and you're now working with the local adjusters. Okay. Now that was an example of filing a claim. If you have, if you're making a phone call, if you're going online and filing the claim, be careful. And I say be careful because they tend to ask a lot more questions when you're filing the claim online than they will on the phone. And you don't, you don't necessarily have to have all of the answers. It's completely acceptable if you don't know exactly, we're on the tree example still, exactly how tall the tree was to just say, not sure. That's okay. What you don't want to do is you don't want to put in, you don't want to guess about so much information that the entire flavor of your claim is so far off from what it actually is. That's what you want to avoid. So when you're filing your claim online, it's okay if you don't have information to say, I don't know, I'm not sure, right? Something like that. And again, what's the mantra? When you think you finished filing the claim, it better give you some claim number or some confirmation number or something. If it didn't, I can almost guarantee you, you have not finished the process. Now, last but not least, filing claims on your phone. This is a big one now, right? We do this a lot more. We do practically everything on our phone. When you file a claim, if you're using the insurance company's app directly, that's what I'm talking about, right? Filing it online or the browser on your phone doesn't really matter. I'm talking now about using the actual application for the insurance company to file the claim. This again, tends to be a very fast process, very few questions, and you will get that confirmation or that claim number. And if not, what are you going to do? Do it again or call or try a different method of filing the claim. That's what I want to leave you with when it comes to filing claims. If you do not get some type of claim number or confirmation number with one of the methods that you've that you filed the claim with, try another one. Don't assume that it's just done, that you've done it. Because if you don't have confirmation, you have nothing to fall back on. You could potentially have problems later. Why did you wait so long to file the claim? And you want to start screaming, I filed the claim. Well, where's your claim number? Give me one. You don't want to get into that. 
So just remember, you've got multiple ways to file claims. If you don't get satisfaction and that claim number or reference number or receipt with one of the routes, go a different route. And with about half an hour, and I just wanted to jump on quickly to answer any questions and give everyone a little bit of heads up that yes, we are dealing with some crazy weather countrywide and you need to do the right thing. You need to take care of yourself. You need to do what you can to be proactive, to avoid having losses, right? Sometimes we forget the best claim is not to have one. Right? I've heard people make comments like, oh, I don't have to worry about that because if there's a loss, my insurance company will pay for it. O okay. And then you'll be upset because your rate goes up because, because you had a claim. The best thing to do is do things to prevent claims. Because if you do that, if everyone starts to do that, then less claims are paid out, premiums go down. We're sort of at the opposite end of the spectrum right now. Everyone has this mentality where they, they're looking at insurance policies more along the lines of savings accounts. Well, I've paid enough years. It's time to get some money back. That's not what an insurance policy is. An insurance policy is there to pay in the event something happens accidentally that you could not have in some way. Obviously, it's not something that you could have done intentionally. That's never covered. But insurance policies are there for accidental and sudden damage. You don't want to rely on it. You want it to be the safety net in the event that all of the things that you do normally fail and there's a loss. Or like I'm talking about now, there's an event like a catastrophe, like a late, like a major rainstorm, or like we were talking about in Florida, a hailstorm, and there's nothing you could do about that, right? It just happens. So I appreciate everyone who jumped on or and popped in. I will be back. We'll do this again. Again, I'm Carl Sussman. This is Insurance Hour. You can find me live at 9 a.m. and on, on multiple radio stations that are syndicated across California. And you'll also get a replay on YouTube and on Twitter sometimes, or X, whatever they're calling it now, and also on your favorite podcast aggregator. Stay safe. Remember, I'm here. If you have questions, feel free to give us a call or shoot us an email at questions at insurancehour.com. And again, as always, this show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa. Have a good night.